Can this unit finally take over my daily drivers? Let's find out. Hello and thank you for clicking on this video where I'll be sharing my experience on iFi Audio's DAC Amp Combo and it is a successor to the NEO IDSD. This is the NEO IDSD 2. This is a 900 US dollar all-in-one setup with tons of feature which we will explore shortly. But before we begin, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank iFi Audio for loaning this unit to me to make this video. However, this unit will be returned to iFi Audio and at the end of the day, all thoughts and opinions are my own and are not influenced by any parties. So let's find out what you get in the box. The unboxing it has a bit of an Apple-like unboxing experience with the color of the box, the picture of the unit at the side of the box, and opening it, you'll be greeted by the unit itself. Of course, it comes with an instruction manual to let you know how to work this device. Under the unit lies all the accessories, so it comes with the power with a dedicated plug, depending on your country, which you simply snap onto it. Which is nice if you want to bring this unit around and use it at different countries. It also comes with a stand so you can put this unit vertically, more on that later. It also comes with a few stickers to solidify your loyalty to the brand. It also comes with a 3.5 to 6.35 millimeter converter, RCA cables which you can use to connect to certain desktop speakers, a USB cable which honestly really short. And I wish this was longer. It's great for laptop use but horrible length for desktop use. Some rubber feet I'm assuming. It also comes with a controller with battery in case you'd like to use the remote instead of clicking on the buttons on the unit itself. It's a simple plastic and feels quite a bit on the cheaper side but it does the job. For the design of the new IDSD2. Unfortunately, I don't have the original, but just looking at the photos, the design remains largely the same except for one obvious change. There's a dedicated power button now, and they've added three additional button features the gain button, a button for X base, and another for X space. Even if you didn't have the original to compare with, the new IDSD2 still looks really sleek. The front panel design just looks really futuristic. You've got the panel screen on the left, the volume knob in the middle, which has some tactile feedback to it which is nice, the joystick light button arrangement next to it, followed by a 4.4mm balanced output and a 6.35mm single-ended output. On the back you've got XLR and RCA outputs, single-ended analog outputs, coaxial, optical, USB, and power. It's covered by an aluminum body with a portion of it being polycarbonate, where all the Bluetooth system is located as this material is used to prevent any connectivity issues that may have arose from using metal. Also, that portion of the body glows when it's turned on, but it's so subtle you won't really notice it unless your room is really dark or pitch black. Also, this unit is surprisingly lightweight. Coming in at 916 gram and comparing the size with some other sources that I have in my collection, is much smaller and narrower than my Hyperman EF400 and it's almost the same size as one of the topping stack. So being an all-in-one unit while having this form factor is a huge plus point if you're looking to maintain your desk space and if you're still pressed for space, iFi has provided this stand that it comes with so that you can place it vertically. Yes, that's right. Another nice little touch as well is the screen will automatically rotate itself to suit your orientation. So it doesn't matter if you decide to place the screen at the top or at the bottom, it'll rotate accordingly, which is nice. Although there were times when I was trying to tilt it upwards from its horizontal position, it did register that as being in the vertical position. So it does take some time fiddling but it'll get there. There's a ton of features in the Neo IDSD2 MQA support, but of course only if you have MQA audio files or stream. The bitrate can support up to 32-bit 384 kHz, which is similar to the Topping D90LE, and it's much higher than the Hi-Fi-Man EF400, which only supports up to 32-bit 192 kHz. But if you're using apps like Spotify, it can only support up to 192 kHz only anyways. So if you're using this for desktop use, which I typically do, you'd have to find softwares which can support up to 384 kHz. But if you're an avid Spotify user, the higher bitrate isn't going to matter much unless Spotify decides to change things up. I'm still waiting, Spotify. So let's run through some of the button controls of this all-in-one. So hitting the top button allows you to toggle between different sources. So on Bluetooth mode, holding the button for one second puts it on pairing mode. And this unit supports aptX lossless, which according to iFi Audio is the world's 
first lossless Bluetooth DAC amp, which means more will follow shortly, but it's always nice to have it if you're purchasing this unit. And you can pair up to eight devices, so you could be pairing this with your computer or your mobile device. And you can either choose to use your headphones or your speakers and play with lossless quality. And even though it isn't entirely compression free, for what it's worth, it gives you a sense of comfort that your music is being played with great quality despite it being on Bluetooth mode. And it opens up a lot of possibilities. But with Bluetooth, there are always variables and it's always more secure having a direct connection to your source. Hitting the button at the bottom toggles the gain. So you have a gain specifically for IEM, which is the lowest gain. And then you have the usual low gain represented by the water, medium gain by the fire, and high gain by the lightning sign, which is a nice change from reading text. This can also be toggled at the settings where it reads which symbol represents which gain you're on. Since we're on that, let's talk about settings. Pressing the volume button once will mute your sound. Pressing and holding your volume button will open up the settings. This is where you toggle your filters, your gain, volume, sync, Bluetooth voice prompt, external sync clock, line out, volume control, factory set, and information about this device. So I'm glad that most of the functions and features are dedicated to the outside buttons with the only feature you want to access from the setting, which are the filters, but you won't access it as often as the other functions or features. Speaking of filters, there are multiple filters available for this DAC amp. You've got STD, I know what you're thinking, get your mind off the gutter, which stands for standard. B P, which stands for bit perfect. GTO means Gibbs transient optimized. Min for minimum phase. However, for me personally, the changes it makes to the sound is extremely minor, to my untrained ears at least. There are very subtle differences. And if you are like me, you really have to focus and just try each filters with your favorite songs and see which one fits best for you. I'm leaning towards the standard or bit perfect filter personally, but your preferences may vary. The biggest difference this unit makes to your sound is actually in the X space and X base features, which I'll talk about more later in the video. Because now that I've tested this feature, I wish it was in every DAC M units. But before we get to it, let's run through some of the minor nitpicks because it just seems like it's all rainbows and unicorns at this point. We have to address the fact that there is no XLR output. So the only balanced output is the 4.4 millimeter output and the 6.35 millimeter output still gives a lot of power, even though it's enough power to drive most headphones. I still wish it had the XLR output as I find myself leaning towards XLR output on my other devices. However, I also understand that they may not work within this form factor, so it's a bit of a give and take there. Also, despite toggling volume matching, it doesn't seem to match what's shown on Windows. It's always off by two or three sometimes. It's not a big deal, but also not a true reflection of the volume I'm listening to. So speaking about power, using numbers on the device as an indication, all testing on low gain, if I'm using the 6.35 millimeter single and the termination with my half iron HE1000 V2, which takes a bit of power to drive this planar magnetic headphone. On the half iron EF400, I'm on the 12 to 1 o'clock dial. On the topping stack, I'm reaching 85 out of 100 on the volume dial, which gives me about 15 to 20% headroom left. However, on the Neo IDSD2, I'm towards the maximum, about 95 to 100 on the volume on low gain. So putting it on the medium gain gives me about 10% more headroom, and on the high highest gain, it gives me another 10%. So I have about 20% of headroom left to play with at high gain on the Hypermind HE1000 V2. And I know that headroom or volume doesn't necessarily equate to whether a source can drive the headphone properly, but it's a rough idea of how much power a source can give your headphones. So for sound, these are my subjective thoughts on the differences I personally felt when listening and comparing between all these sources. The new IDSD2 at base setting without any features turned on and on the standard setting, it sits right in the middle between the topping stack and the high firm EF400, testing it with the Focal Utopia on the 6.35mm termination and the Thea Audio Monarch Mark III on the 44 balance termination. Transitioning from the topping stack to the Neo IDSD2, it sounded a touch warmer on the Neo IDSD2. Notes are not as clean or sharp. You could hear a touch more from the background music on the topping stack, but there's a bit more breathing room on the Neo IDSD2. However, it has a flatter sounding presentation compared to the Hyperman EF400. However, these differences are so subtle that to an unsuspecting ear listening to any of these sources for the first time, unless they are hypersensitive to all the micro nuances of the music, or if you're really focusing hard to find these differences, 
chances are it's going to slip by you. However, what's not so subtle is the differences that the Neo IDSD2 makes with its features. And as mentioned earlier, is one of those things that I wish every source gear would have. The X space and the X base feature. So what do they do? So the left button will toggle the X space feature. But basically what it does is vocals will be a bit recessed, giving you an illusion of distance and a sense of space within the sound. However, it does have its drawbacks and personally is my least used Used feature because the vocals in the track loses its focus and sometimes the background music can take the spotlight. So I typically pair this feature with the X bass feature turned on or I'm thinking something that already has a full very forward presentation can benefit from this feature. Now my favorite feature to use between the two is the X bass. Pressing the right button allows you to toggle between different modes of the X bass feature and you can see it from the color on the X. So the blue X bass represents the bass boost, the green X represents the presence boost, and the red is essentially both the blue and red mode turned on. So what do they do? If you have an IAM or headphone that you feel is lacking a bit of that punch and slam from the deep end, turn this feature on and it'll have a bit more meat to the bones. Of course, don't be expecting to turn something like the 700 Sound Note Zero into a fat freak maestro mini, but at least I can say there's definitely an increase in the lower regions to notice a difference. The green X bass, which represents the presence feature, gives it a bit more presence, pun intended, to the vocals and upper regions of the frequency. So there's a bit more clarity, vocals take center stage, and the lower regions take a back seat on the tracks. So if you have a gear that's really focused on getting the lower regions out, and you wish there's a bit more vocal presence or clarity, this feature helps bring that out a little bit. The red X bass, as also mentioned earlier, is essentially both blue and green feature combined. So you get the bass boost and the presence boost coming together as a package. So if you want more slam, impact, vocal presence, sharpness, turning the red X bass on helps with that. And it pushes everything forward and it comes right at you. And if you're about musical engagement, the red X bass just takes it to the next level. Even though this setting is by far my most used feature among everything mentioned earlier, it is somewhat of a double edged sword. Because of the fact that everything in the frequency is boosted and is all coming all at once. So it's definitely not a setting for one looking for a relaxed, laid back presentation. Or even if you have a headphone or IAM with a forward type of presentation, hitting that red X bass will make it a little bit too forward or shouty for some. As mentioned before, having all these features are merely options for you to play around with. So using my own headphones as guinea pigs, testing it with the Focal Utopia, which is a headphone with a warm presentation with plenty of details, but those details can appear a little bit soft in nature. While it has enough bass to accompany your tracks, pushing the X bass red simply transforms the Focal Utopia into an engaging, bass loving detail monster. But I never turn the X bass on for this headphone because it just makes everything sounds unnaturally flat and thin. I also love turning on the red X bass with my Thea Audio Monarch Mark III. It just gives it a bit more oomph to the bass and a bit more sharpness to the upper regions. Or even with my Hyperman HG-1000 V2s, since that headphone has a lot of width and depth in the soundstage with a lot of details coming through. I just toggled the X bass blue, which brings the bass out and it brings out what I felt was lacking from that headphone. Of course, it doesn't suddenly turn the HG-1000 V2 into a head bobbing headphone, but it just gives that bass note a bit more meat. Turning X bass or X bass presence would spell disaster because it'll just sound like a spear through your skull and everything will sound super recessed. What about something that already has a ton of bass but lacks the upper regions, enter the Fat Freak Maestro SE. Pairing the X bass blue with the Maestro SE is simply bass galore. It's like a preview of what the Scarlet SE, if Fat Freak decides to make one, could sound like. Just bass bliss. However, that aside, this is one of those gears that would benefit from having X bass turned on, but also the red X bass. So with the red X bass, it gives it a bit more presence in the upper region, but it also brings in the bass and it pushes it all forward. So turning the X bass on gives it a bit more space and you're just getting 
setting it all. Otherwise, I just turn on the green X base, which is the presence feature, and just have the lovely sound of the Maestro SE with a touch more treble. So just wrapping up talking about these features, I've never had this much fun playing with a source gear and it's all done through analog which is great as it saves you from having to play around with EQ because with EQ, you can't just boost the bass without tweaking the rest of the frequency. But with the X space and X bass features, with a simple click of a button, you can give your gears a different personality and that's what makes this unit stand out from the rest. One last thing to point out before I conclude this already long video is its heat. With all this talk about how much power it can generate in this form factor, through my testing, this unit remains warm at best, which is surprising considering my other sources, despite having the same amount of testing time, the topping stack is really hot to the touch almost too hot to touch. And the Hyperman EF400 is not as hot as the topping stack, but it's still warmer than the Neo IDSD2. So if this is consistent throughout all their units, iFi Audio is doing something right with heat dissipation, which I think deserves some credit. So to sum it all up, I don't think it's any secret at this point how much I'm loving the Neo IDSD2. There's enough power in this unit to drive any headphones in your collection while still having some features to give your favorite headphones a different identity to suit your mood on the day, and that is invaluable. However, you do have to decide if not having XLR outputs is something you'd be willing to accept. And for me personally, if you're looking for an all-in-one source specifically for gear testing, the Hyperman EF400 is still the more convenient choice solely because of the many output options to test any gears while still being a solid, dedicated, all-in-one desktop source. But if you're not looking to test gears and you just want a solid, powerful, all-in-one source that can do everything and still give you something special, the iFi Audio Neo IDSD2 is the one to beat. With that all said, that concludes my experience of the iFi Audio Neo IDSD2. And once again, Thank you to iFi Audio for allowing me to have this experience. It's going to be sad to be parting ways with this unit as I had so much fun with it, but I'm curious to know your thoughts. Will the Neo IDSD2 be the all-in-one unit for you? Comment below, let me know. Thank you all very much for watching this long video, and I look forward to seeing all of you in the next experience.